Hello everyone, Hyper here, and welcome to the Big Dumb Strats video for Mythic Shadhar. Now, uh, this is either the fourth or fifth boss you do in the raid, depending on your raid comp and what your raid decided to do. But needless to say, it's a fairly easy boss. The biggest thing on this fight is a general damage check, along with avoiding some nasty overlaps, especially in phase two. We also have a written version of this guide available over on Wowhead and you can find the link to that in the description box and in the comment section below. The mythic specific change is probably not going to cause most raids too many issues because there's a pretty cut and dry formula for how you deal with it. So on mythic the boss will periodically gain a stack of hungry and if he reaches 10 stacks it essentially means a wipe. The boss enrages, kills everyone on the next ability. And to deal with this, every time a living miasma explodes, which is the little blob that fixates a player, a tasty morsel will spawn. You can run over this tasty morsel, then run in, into the boss, and that will reset the boss's hungry stacks. The way you deal with this mechanic is super straightforward. You feed the very first morsel that comes out in the fight, and then you feed every other one. One caveat that you need to be aware of is that if you feed every other one, you cannot kite the living miasmas around. So if you kite two back to back, the boss will most likely reach 10 stacks. So you either need to run into the second living miasma or the first one, but you can't kite both of them. The phase one strategy is super straightforward. You want to tank the boss in the center of the room with melee DPS loosely spread around him. I recommend having your melee DPS stand very close to the boss. And then once the puddles come out, they just take a step back and they should still be in melee range of the boss to hit him because this boss's hitbox is actually pretty large. So you don't lose any downtime by having to dodge. Other than that, we also prefer to have one section of the room that's kind of des designated for living miasma explosions, especially if the melee get targeted, they know which section of the room they should run to where the least amount of players are most likely to be. Other than that, in this phase, you simply want to DPS the boss, dodge the puddles, and then feed every other tasty morsel to the boss to reset his hungry stacks. For ideal push time, what you should be looking at is somewhere around a minute and 50 or faster. If you push the boss to phase 2 by about a minute and 50, your raid's DPS is most likely on track. So after you push the boss, you want to wait a little bit and you want to bloodlust at 2 minutes. And this is of course because all of your 2 minute classes will have their cooldowns back up, so it just makes bloodlust a little bit more efficient. For phase 2, this is really the only part of the fight where you might lose a few people and you might get some very nasty overlaps that can cause easy wipes. The mechanic in phase two that you need to deal with is entropic buildups. And these will periodically spawn around the room. They're little orbs. They exist on heroic too, but they're basically not noticeable. And these orbs, whenever you soak them and they're fully soaked, they explode, deal raid wide damage. And also they deal damage to the person who's soaking them, but that's kind of not enough damage to really worry about. So if you have a living miasma spawn at the same time as entropic buildups, your raid leader or whoever's doing callouts needs to make a quick decision whether you're going to quickly explode the living miasma or that person should be kiting and the other people should be soaking the entropic buildups. If you have both buildups and miasma and you soak all of them and the miasma explodes, you're going to instantly wipe. It's just way too much raid damage. So the way you want to deal with this is kind of stagger the damage. Don't soak all the buildups at the same time. Maybe mark one that you leave up and you deal with it once the rate's stabilized. But essentially, you don't want to oversoak here. You want to take it kind of slow and just DPS the boss and deal with mechanics when your rate is healthy enough to do so. Also in this phase, it's very important that your raid is spread out throughout the room because entropic breath is essentially unavoidable. And if you have a huge clump of players in a specific area of the room and they all get targeted by Entropic Breath, that's going to put a huge strain on your healers and can easily combo people. For your phase 2 push timing, you should be looking to push the boss to phase 3 before you get the 5th set of Entropic buildups. Because if that happens, you're most likely going to be losing people just because of how healing intensive this phase is. 
So as long as you only have four sets of buildups, you're on track to make the damage check. If you're getting the fifth set, I'd highly suggest moving some cooldowns around, see how people are optimizing and second potting that phase, just to make sure that you avoid getting the fifth set of buildups. Once you push to the last phase, if you have everyone alive, it's pretty much a free win. Basically, you want to stack up behind the boss. You need to keep in mind that the dot from phase two will be rolling over to phase three and doesn't time out instantly. So for the first part of phase three, you will be taking a huge amount of damage. This means that during the first two living miasma explosions, your raid needs to have some sort of healing cooldowns. If you have darknesses, spirit links, any type of damage reduction cooldowns for those, this is the place to use it because your raid is essentially taking double damage from both phase two and phase three. But once the debuff times out, the raid can kind of stabilize a little bit. For the movement, you don't need to be super strict here. Basically just stack behind the boss whenever you see the green swirlies spawn under your feet, call out for the whole raid to move a little bit and the boss should get dragged along with the raid and just stay behind the boss. This should also bait the breath back towards the puddles, so your raid should be free to just run through him and be in a safe spot. In this phase, kiting living miasmas becomes a little bit more difficult just because you're restricted on the space you're able to use. For the first two or three, we tend to just take them to the opposite side of the platform, and then once the room is a little bit more restricted and there's more puddles, we either kite them way ahead of the raid, or if there's some little open spots that you can squeeze in, then you go way behind the raid. But you never really want to explode those near the raid, because in this phase, they will most likely wipe you. A few tips to mention, the slow from Living Miasma fixating a player can be mitigated by any ability that essentially overrides slows, such as Freedom, uh, Wraith Walk, Death's Advance, Tiger's Lust, basically anything along those lines can help you. And if your rate has a lot of monks and paladins, then make sure you keep an eye on who's being targeted. And if they need an external cooldown to be able to kite the living miasma, make sure to use it on them. And then lastly, make sure you keep an eye on who has the debuff from picking up a tasty morsel. If you pick up a tasty morsel, you're not going to be able to feed the boss for the rest of the encounter. So later on in the fight in phase two, phase three, people will most likely have debuffs and if they get fixated, they need to call out for someone else to come pick up the morsel and feed it to the boss if they're not able to do so. And make sure you do this with plenty of time because sometimes um, depending on ability queuing, it might be cutting it kind of close if you're feeding every other one. So if you call it out last minute, they might not be able to help you out. For the damage section, this is a patchwork fight, pure single target with a few damage checks. So as far as optimizing, go the strongest single target build you can. Corruption such as Infinite Stars is fairly strong on this fight because it is pure single target and there's no off targets to kind of snipe your procs. And other than that, two minute cooldowns are very beneficial on this boss because you're able to use your two minute on pull and then use a second two minute during Bloodlust and another two minute in the last phase. So two minute cooldowns are probably the strongest on this fight out of any classes. Uh, however, two, three minute cooldowns and four minute cooldowns, whether or not you're a demon hunter or some other class, do have their uses, especially in the first phase and the last phase to help you with those burns. But those classes typically tend to have a little bit lower DPS output in the middle phase. I definitely recommend that most of your DPS second pot in phase two, uh, especially if you're using Unbridled Fury. If your class uses something else that helps you with execute damage, uh, most notably for Arms Warriors here, then you can hold it off until the last phase. But if your class uses Unbridled Fury as its main DPS pot, you should be using it in phase two every time to help with the damage check. This fight combines two types of damage that can be very lethal to DPS players, and that's steady ticking damage combined with huge bursts of damage in between. And most notably, if you get targeted by the first cast of debilitating spit, this is when it has four stacks, you definitely need to save a defensive cooldown. To give you an example, as a death knight, 
I kept my Icebound Fortitude throughout the entire fight just in case I got targeted by debilitating spit. And if that went on me, then I used Icebound Fortitude. If it didn't, then I just sat on the cooldown for the entire fight. So other classes, you might have similar abilities to deal with it. Just make sure you have something, or if you don't, you need to let your healers know. Otherwise, you will most likely die to this ticking debuff. So now we'll talk about healing Shadhar. You'll probably want to run four healers because DPS is very important on this fight, but you can opt to run five if you feel you're struggling in the healing department. In terms of meta healers, Holy Pally is very strong, as well as Resto Shaman. This priest has its benefits here, but the former are definitely stronger for this fight. One key benefit of Holy Pally is that they bring freedom, which is exceptionally strong for players who get fixated to negate that slow. In terms of healing this fight, there's really not a lot of time that there isn't massive raid-wide damage happening, so for assigning cooldowns, generally we just assign them around when Living Miasma spawn, because that's going to be an additional burst of raid-wide damage. Living Miasma spawn every 30 seconds, so you should rotate cooldowns roughly every 30 seconds. One thing to note is that you should rotate your cooldowns so that you're not overlapping with your co-healers, because there is going to be damage happening at all times, so you don't want to run into a period of time where you do not have cooldowns rolling. So beyond the living miasmas, you can have nasty overlaps where you have to soak in tropic buildups and then have a miasma spawn and explodes and you take a significant burst of damage. And you should just be aware of these potential overlaps and either tell the fixated player to delay their explosion or rush into the add to desync those bursts. And then finally, the only other thing to consider for healers is the debilitating spit. You should track this and pay attention to who gets the first four stacks specifically as that person is going to need significant spot healing. And additionally, you should absolutely scream at them if they don't pop a personal for that four stack. Tanking on Shadhar does not favor any particular class and is not much different than Heroic. Position Shadhar in the first two phases in the center of the room and kite him around the edge in the last phase, moving for bubbling overflows. There is no dedicated crush or dissolve tanks across all combos. Whichever tank has aggro going into the combo takes the first ability, and the other tank will take the second. Whoever ends up getting two stacks of either ability wants to tank as little as possible afterwards. Sometimes ability ordering doesn't allow you to do this, but do your best to keep the damage split between your two tanks. While not tanking, try to make yourself available to do other mechanics, especially in phase two where your DPS are trying to burn. Primarily, this would be a feed or soaking an orb. You can use your cooldowns if you are going to take the second hit of a double crush, or late into the last phase just on melees to help your healers. And thank you guys so much for watching this video, and if you enjoyed it or it helped you out, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more content. And again, if you'd like to read this guide instead of rewatching the video for specific pointers you can find the written version on wowhead the link to which is in the description box thanks to champion lozy for helping me out and i'll see you guys on the next one bye bye